And now we'd like to introduce Ken Pierce from Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And Ken is going to take us into the wonderful world of GIS and some recent impervious cover data that he and his colleagues just released. So welcome, Ken. Hi. Thanks for stopping by. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about sort of just basic data here about imperviousness, uh, especially within Puget Sound. As Department of Fish and Wildlife, we're obviously interested in maintaining fish and wildlife. And major challenges to maintaining fish are maintaining stream flow. So we're keenly interested in how uh, development occurs throughout the Sound. And we'd like to be able to catch it at intermediate stages of development as seen here. So I'm probably talking to the choir here a bit on the watershed stuff, but there are a whole bunch of aspects to the hydrologic cycle that come into play based on uh, whether you have impervious surfaces or not. The, the big one is simply infiltration and recharging of streams and recharging of groundwater. Uh, if you shorten the length of time it takes to for water to get back to the sound, then you don't have time for it to infiltrate into the landscape to become water for vegetation and critters and and us you wind up with the flashy stream flows because it all as opposed to having to seep through the ground goes right into the sewer systems and dumps right into the streams so perviousness is a big deal let's look at perviousness in Puget Sound so this is a little view of Huck 10 watersheds which are hydrologic code watersheds from USGS of different sizes here and they're color coded according to their level of imperviousness now this particular imperviousness data comes from uh, Landsat data, which is 30 meter satellite data. And what you can see is that in the, in the red, uh, we have imperviousness percentages, uh, anywhere from 15 to 32 uh, percent, which is pretty high, and ranging outward from our urbanized areas up to upper, upper elevation watersheds, which have almost no imperviousness. There are a variety of studies out that say that uh, watersheds with imperviousness levels anywhere from 2 or 3 percent up to 10 percent and above uh, are considered impacted for a variety of different reasons. Both 7 percent and 10 percent are sort of quoted pretty often as uh, levels of imperviousness after which stream flow and uh, animal habitat is degraded. And we can see here that we have a lot of watersheds that are already there and pretty much everything in the periphery around our major downtown areas is approaching those percentages. So we at the Department of Fish and Wildlife have a change detection program and that mostly uh, came about due to uh, sudden availability of data. Our problem for change was really this. Um, that there are two views of the shore and the standard land cover and land cover change products that have been available to us are derived from this same 30 meter data that the imperviousness information was, was just shown from. Problem is if you are looking for regulated areas like 35 foot buffer around the stream or a 50 foot buffer or the 200 foot area from the upper for high water mark inland um, it's very hard to be able to find what's really going on with 30 meter data. In 2009, we got the first or the, the second go round of NAEP data for all of Puget Sound, which is one meter aerial imagery. And since it was the second go round in 2009, we were able to try to figure out how to do change between two time periods. And that is a long subject, which I'm not going to spend much time on. Pretty much going to talk about some of the main reasons we wanted to do this is with the one meter data we could try to find uh, much more we could try to ask much more detailed questions about locations as to where changes are. Most of what we map we don't map all sorts of land cover changes but we mostly map ones having to do with urbanization and forestry events. Uh, at the moment the completed time periods are 2006 to 2009 and 2009 to 2011 and those are available now. Uh, we are working on 2011 to 2013. A nice aspect about this is that it's really fine scale data but it's done consistently throughout Puget Sound. And the other motivation other than just our own internal applications are to try to help local partners answer sort of basic questions about land cover change. And um, 
that's why it has to have a very high level of accuracy as well as uh, spatial precision. So what we found is between 2006 and 2011, looking at various county population quotes, we looks like there are about a quarter of a million people have come to Puget Sound during this time period. And based on our impervious change statistics, it appears that they, on average, uh, are accompanied by about a 1,500 square foot increase in impervious surfaces. Now, this 1,500 square feet is, is sort of an overall average for people. So it includes both uh, new houses and the infrastructure that goes into those houses and commercial infrastructure, all those sorts of things. So, so some portion of that 1,500 might be their uh, individual new dwellings, as we see here, and the rest of it's going to go into all of the other stuff that occurs with urbanization. So this is sort of a picture of the sort of scale events that we try to look for. In our change data, there are pretty much six attributes at each location where we've mapped some kind of a change. There is a attempt to put down what the type of the change is, and, and the big ones are development, forestry, uh, natural changes, and tree removal, which is sort of a catch-all for places where you can't quite tell what the purpose of the change is. In each of the locations, we have the percentage of change uh, in 25% increments. And then the important ones are a decrease in total tree cover. This is more than any other talk I've ever had. There'll be a huge caveat on the next two lines, which I will try to explain. Uh, and that is the increase in impervious surface. And we measure an increase in semi-pervious surface. So I want to make it perfectly, perfectly clear that these assessments are done using uh, one meter aerial imagery. The idea between looking at impervious and semi-pervious surface is that impervious in this case are things that look obviously impervious, such as new roads, uh, new houses, things that are obviously man-made structures. And then in this case, semi-pervious surfaces are places that look like they are gravel roads or places that have been heavily compacted between the two time periods by you know, moving vehicles and things. So there is no inclination here that we are capturing partially pervious pavers or anything along those lines. It would be great to include that kind of information in the future. But uh, from a remote sensing standpoint, it is going to have to be reported that you know this location in Tacoma or this location in, in a certain area has been specifically done as, as a semi-pervious location. And that would be great to include that, that data. So everything I'm going to show here is pretty much just assuming that if it looks like it, it is. And we also include starting land cover so that you can ask interesting questions of that data. OK, so, so here's sort of an example of what we have at these individual locations. This is a really obvious one. This is a forest going to develop. There's a little red polygon you can kind of see surrounding this area. And the, the area inside the polygon is the only thing that we're actually reporting on. So this starts off at about 17 acres. And we can see that it uh, is a development type change. That's pretty obvious. The whole thing changed, so it's 100% tree decrease, 100%. And then maybe we have 50% new impervious surfaces there and about 25% compacted and gravel surfaces. What you're looking at right here is exactly what the analyst looks at when they assign all of these things. So each one of these locations, an analyst looks at these two pictures and from, from this information assesses these values. Slightly more nuanced uh, version here, which is why we have as many different types of change as possible because it's not always uniform. So here's a much smaller location. It's about 2 thirds of an acre instead of 17 acres. And different stuff happens in this location. It's a development type change. But the total area in that polygon that change is probably only about 50%. And in one corner, you've got tree decrease of about 25%. In another area, we've got a new house. So that closes. that's our impervious increase. And it looks like there's you know, drive, drive access that's probably dirt and a variety of uh, area where they probably parked things, which were grassy. And so we're going to up our, we're going to say we've got about 25% semi-pervious there. And that is an idea to try to reflect as much information as we can get from, from this type of analysis. All right, so we have a map of this. So we have uh, roughly 95,000 locations like this that have been looked at throughout Puget Sound for this five-year time period. Now we have a total map of about 167,000 acres of change. And if you look down the bottom there, you'll see a uh, 
blue squiggly line around the Raya 13, which is uh, Thurston County's Puget Sound watershed that drains into the sound there. And that's about 170,000 acres. So if you squished all those dots and things into uh, one little tight area, that's about the total area we're talking about. That breaks down to about 112,000 acres of timber harvest and then about 36,000 acres of unassigned canopy removal with about 9,500 acres of new impervious. And that logistically comes out pretty well if you think of a quarter acre lot is going to have maybe a fourth of that lot might actually have the house on it. Then you know, you've got about a fourth of the impervious per uh, canopy removal. And that, that, those numbers work out pretty well. We can look at the increase uh, by these same watersheds that we looked at a few minutes ago, and we can see that uh, you know suspect places where you'd expect in this sort of bathtub ring around the lower elevations of Puget Sound is where you've got most of the action. Some of the uh, Raya 12 and some of the King County, a couple of those watersheds have you know 500 more acres of new impervious surface during that five years. That's that's quite a bit. This gives a little idea of what it looks like around the sound. Uh, here we can look at tree decrease and so at the same time you know you've got a loss of canopy. Now when I did this particular statistic this includes forestry and so you get sort of some obvious big players in there and this is actually the reason that we include the cha change agent into this analysis so that we can not that I did it here but should have uh, sort of take out forestry and look to see uh, what we think the residual signature of, of what are really more permanent changes in other areas. So this would be a little more informative if I had pulled the forestry out and, and just done the uh, non-forestry related canopy removal. As I said, you can ask lots and lots of questions of this data and these are just a couple of examples that seem to be uh, fairly relevant here. So as I say, we have uh, this data is available for these two different time periods. By early next year, we'll have the 2011 to 2013 data to add to this. There is an SMP monitoring project going on in Thurston County right now, and they're trying to look into you know, how much our data reflects, can be used as a way to monitor permit compliance and what's going on at the shoreline in that 200-foot buffer, and so that's, uh, that's something undergoing at the moment. We don't do land cover modeling at the moment, but we are experimenting with it. It's extraordinarily difficult to do with this high resolution data, but we're getting closer. Hopefully next time around we will have, uh, we will have that as an addition. We're going to fly these uh, same, the same data this summer, sometime in the next couple of months, um, and assuming our funding comes through, we will, as soon as we're done with the 11 to 13 data, dive into the 2013 to 2015 data. So we're slowly building up a uh, a nice data set of urbanization and, and how changes occur in Puget Sound. And oh, this was a slide I, I stole that I thought was just sort of an interesting depiction here that you know if you have a, no impervious surfaces and you have three inches of rain, you know you've got about 2.4 out of those 0.6 inches seeps into the ground and goes into the whole stream and ground flow network and a very small amount just runs right off and when you get all the way down to the uh, fully impervious surface they've really flopped and, and, and most of that water is running right off not really being able to be utilized by man or beast. If you think about long term how do we fit another million people into Puget Sound or two million people and and maintain our quality of life and our quality of you know the wildlife and all the natural things we really enjoy having here on into the future I think things like trying to fix our imperviousness using semi-pervious you know, solutions in areas that don't have really high traffic. One of the technological ways we can really try to do that. Okay, if you want more information, here are, here's my phone number and my email, and Matt Muller is our uh, land use change outreach coordinator. It's actually his job is to help people with this data set. Thank you, Ken. That was wonderful. So what are the red watersheds by name? Well, that's a great question. You can probably go find what they are by their Huck value, which is a string of about 12 numbers. Very exciting. Is data set available online? Ye yes and no. Um, it's uh, definitely available. Uh, I don't have a link for it right now, um, though the current download is, um, you can download it from, a, from our Dropbox. Uh, so it is available. In the next couple of days, it's actually going up as a map service on our PH map layer, uh, so people can access it sort of directly through that. In the not too distant future, it will also be just a click onable download link.